Hey everybody, it's Allison with the Fort Bend Museum and today we're going to talk about the runaway scrape. Now the runaway scrape is really hard to nail down specifically because it's not one single event in one single location, it's sort of a mass movement of people. So we're going to talk about it in a little bit general terms, but we're going to try and go into specifics where possible. Now, The first thing we need to do is to orient you to the situation. So you probably know by now that the first uh, Anglo settlers came to Texas starting around 1821, 1822, they start arriving. And then in 1824, the first legal land grants are issued. They are given their land and they immediately start out doing what they are told to do, which is to improve that land. So they start building houses, they start building pigsties, they start building chicken coops, they start adding fences to keep their cows in or out, depending on what kind of thing you are fencing. And they start building creature comforts to make themselves feel more at home, like four poster beds or looms or spinning wheels. So they are building things and adding things and improving on their land, which is actually in their contract. That's what they're supposed to do. Now, most of these settlers weren't really concerned with like politics or um, the greater Texas area. They were just concerned with their own farms or their own land because that's where their scope was. That's what they were doing. Now, that all kind of changes in 1830. So the Fredonia Rebellion happens in 1826 and Mexico sends someone to sort of check on Texas at this point. And as a result of that report that is issued, there is a law passed. It's the law of April 6, 1830. And it's passed by the government in Mexico City. And this law forbids any additional Anglo settlers from entering Texas. And it also takes steps to start um, expelling slavery from Texas. And it also puts a lot of taxes and tariffs on the settlers that already live in Texas. So it sort of changes the, um, it changes how people are living in Texas because it directly affects them when previously they hadn't really been bothered by the government. So starting in 1830, there's a few rumblings here and there. And again, most people in Texas were very locally focused. So if there was something happening many, many miles away, they weren't as concerned. Now, the Anahuac disturbances that sprung up from the 1830 law sort of made everyone take notice. They knew that there was some grumbling here and there. And then um, in 1835, a new army was sent to Texas to sort of reman all the forts. The forts had been abandoned by the Mexican army after the Anahuac disturbances, they all pulled back. And so this new army of 300 to 500 people was sent to reman all of Texas. And at this point, everyone's a little suspicious of the army because they feel like, Ugh, you're gonna make us pay taxes, aren't you? So um, starting in 1835, there are a few more direct confrontations between the settlers and the army itself. So the Battle of Gonzales happens when the army is sent to Gonzales to pick up a cannon. And instead of peacefully handing over the cannon, the Texans raise a militia, uh, attack the army and send them back to San Antonio. So that leads to the Texas militia gathering up more people and laying siege to the whole town of San Antonio. They are trying to kick the army out and they ultimately succeed in doing this in early December of 1835. They kick the entire Mexican army out of Texas. So in early 1836, when they hear that Santa Ana is headed towards them, settlers that are closer to San Antonio start packing up and moving. They don't want to be in the way of this invading army. And um, also at this time, it was when the convention was being held that would ultimately declare Texas a free republic and set up a provisional government. So there's a number of things happening at this time and a lot of the settlers start to notice the politics that are occurring within their state or their area. So in order to best describe the runaway scrape, I'm going to rely heavily on the recountants of Delu Rose Harris. She did survive through this entire experience and wrote about it. And so using her words will really tell you the um, emotions that people were feeling as they were going through this. So the first thing to remember is that after the Alamo fell, people started to get worried. This was when they started to leave and they started to pack up or if they weren't preparing to leave right that second, they were thinking about what they were gonna do and how they were gonna hide all their furniture or maybe hide their valuables and then take just what they needed. Some people were going with just the clothes on their back, maybe a blanket or two, and then trying to head out and get as far as they could. Um, as Delu Rose Harris mentions, every family in our neighborhood was preparing to go to the United States and wagons and other vehicles were scarce. 
So those people that had moved to Texas years before, they had oftentimes reappropriated their wagons into other things they needed more. So the people of the settlers of Texas knew that they couldn't take all their possessions with them. So it became this trick of what are you going to hide? What are you going to take? What are you going to leave? And so a lot of valuable possessions were hidden or they would find like a group of trees or maybe river bottom and they'd place a lot of their maybe like their beds or different things that were bulky but valuable to them in these different areas just around their homes so that maybe if the army came through they wouldn't find them. Now, um, if you've ever looked at a map of Texas, especially along the coast from, um, let's say, from like Corpus Christi all the way to the border of Louisiana, you will notice that there are rivers just snaking up from the Gulf into Texas. And so that became the real danger of the runaway scrape was not even the army that was chasing them, but the rivers that they were crossing. So you throw all your goods together, you grab all your children, you get everything you can figure out how to carry. Mostly it's what you physically can carry yourself and you head east. So you've got to start crossing rivers. Now the Brazos River was one that many people crossed pretty early on. So the ferries were still in operation, there were still people to help you. And that, that river in particular wasn't necessarily a problem. Now, most people would be fording the river at a ferry, but um, even that wasn't as easy as it sounds. In March of 1836, Delu Rose Harris's family arrives in the San Jacinto Prairie. They cross Vince's Bridge, which um, becomes important at the Battle of San Jacinto, but at this point that had to happen, so it was still standing. And then they have to cross the Trinity River. And this was her quote. There were fully 5,000 people at the ferry. We waited three days before we crossed. Everyone was trying to cross first and it was almost a riot. We got over the third day and after traveling a few miles came to a huge prairie. So every ferry was backed up. Everyone wanted to cross first and it became a pretty bad situation. Now she goes on to detail that after they crossed the river and they came to this prairie, they started getting bogged down in mud. This was the rainy season. It was horribly wet outside. The rivers were rising. The alligators were out in full force. Everything became dangerous. She goes on to mention how almost every wagon that was brought with their group ends up being bogged down in the mud and abandoned over the next couple of days. They end up crossing another river and then the river rises one more time. Um, one of her sisters got sick at this point, so they managed to cross the river first. But then um, in the dead of night, all the men had to build a raft in order to float back to gather the families that got stuck on a river bottom and were left there overnight because no one could figure out how to get them out. Luckily, those families were rescued by that raft and everyone ended up finally getting to the town of Liberty where they stayed for a couple of weeks. Now at this time, disease was running rampant through these people. They were scared, they were stressed, they weren't in their homes, they were cold, they were wet for days on end. Everything they owned was wet. Um, and at this point, Delu Rose Harris's younger sister does die and they do bury her at Liberty. Now they stay at Liberty for a while and then one night they hear thunder. Um, I wanna read another quote from her. One Thursday evening, all of a sudden, we heard a sound like distant thunder. When it was repeated, father said it was a cannon and that the Texans and Mexicans were fighting. He had been through the war of 1812 and knew it was a battle. Now, um, when they heard these cannons, the family once again prepared to leave. They prepared to just head out because they felt that the army was right behind them. Um, she goes on to say, the young men came with their guns and when the writer got near enough for us to understand what it was, he said, it was turn back. The Texans have whipped the Mexican army and the Mexicans are prisoners. No danger, no danger, turn back. Then he got to the camp and he could scarcely speak because he was so excited and so out of breath. So the dangerous flight was over, but that didn't mean that the runaway scrape was done. These Anglo settlers have run away from their homes with just the clothes on their back most of the time. They have crossed rivers, they have braved floods, and they have faced down the threat of alligators. And now they're finally being told, you can go back home. But that's not really the end of this, because now they have to cross back over those rivers, brave those same floods again, and face down the exact same alligators as the first time. And now this time they're tired, they're stressed out, and they're really wet, and they're not sure what they're returning to. A lot of families never returned. They were already in Louisiana or really close to it, so they just kept going. They returned to the United States and never came back.
Um, many families did return though. They did brave it back, but it was no less dangerous traveling back home than it was traveling to Louisiana in the first place. Um, another quote from Delu Rose Harris. This one's a kind of a long quote, but it's, it's a bit more of a story. It had been raining two days and nights. There was a bayou to cross over which there was no bridge. And the only way to go was three miles through the bay to get around the mouth of the bayou. There were guideposts to point out the way, but it was very dangerous. If we got near the mouth of the bayou, there was quicksand. If the wind rose, the waves rolled high. The bayou was infested with alligators. And this is just one example of a place they had to cross. But that's not the end of her quote. She goes on to describe something that had happened to another family. A few days before our family arrived at the bay, a Mr. King was caught by one alligator and carried underwater. He was going east with his family. He swam his horses across the mouth of the bayou, and then he swam back to the west side and drove the cart into the bay. His wife and children became frightened and he turned back and said he would go up the river and wait for the water to subside. He got his family back on land, swam the bayou to bring the horses back, and he'd gotten nearly all the way across with them when a large alligator appeared. Miss King first saw it above water and screamed. The alligator struck her husband with its tail and he went underwater. Um, they didn't manage to rescue Mr. King. He did perish in the battle, but then the rest of the people in this area did stake out a piece of beef and they ultimately killed the large alligator, which Deleu Rose Harris mentioned seeing and was terrified of. So that's the story of the runaway scrape. It was a desperate attempt of all these families that had come to Texas, settled, built their homes, built their lives, and then had to abandon everything to run away from an oncoming army. Um, there's a quote from Santa Ana saying that he considered these settlers to be pirates and undeserving of mercy. So I think the settlers made the right call to run, but um, it definitely wasn't an easy call to make, and it definitely wasn't an easy journey to take. And that's the runaway scrape.